Today we have the pleasure to have Professor Mark Werner as speaker of our joint physics, physics department and International Institute of Physics uh, uh, joint colloquium. Professor Werner earned uh, his PhD at the University of Cambridge under Sammy Edwards. Uh, later he worked as a postdoc with uh, Paul Flory, Flory, Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1974. Back then, uh, Professor Werner worked uh, on problems on polymers and liquid crystals. Then uh, he returned to Cambridge uh, as a faculty member where he's currently professor of theoretical physics. Uh, professor Werner's main research area is liquid crystal elastomers with tools from statistical mechanics and more recently also from uh, geometry. He is the author of uh, 170 scientific publications and notably he was, uh, um, he was I mean, uh, he earned uh, the uh, 2003 Europhysics uh, uh, prize uh, for discoveries in liquid crystals elastomers. The title of today's colloquium is uh, Inducing Curved Matrix in Materials Gives New Mechanics. So please welcome Professor uh, Mark Werner. Well, thank you very much. It's a great honor to give this uh, seminar and a great pleasure to be in Brazil again after 10 years, um, a country I really have grown to love and too much of it's been from afar, sadly, but uh, here I am back again. It's great. Um, it's also great to be at a conference uh, so dedicated to geometry. Um, I should say at the outset that I'm not a geometer, and indeed you can see I talk about it as an outsider, um, but it has a powerful influence on uh, complex materials, and I want to try and explore that today. So that's my purpose, you've seen here. Um, I have two co-workers uh, in particular, Carl Modis and uh, Cyrus Mostajaran, whom I'd like to acknowledge right at the beginning. And actually behind this is work which comes from uh, Sharon's group over several years. And when I give a more technical seminar on uh, Thursday, which will explain perhaps some of this in greater detail, I will explore that connection with this uh, work of these other people. And I'll mention that as we go through. So basically the bottom line of this is I would like to manipulate the, man, uh, the metric in order to get strong actuation. And I have a number of demonstrations which I hope to show you and convince you of that. And as I said that, I realized that I've lost my central demonstration. Doesn't matter, I'll have to think of it. Ah, oh, that's another one that will come up. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try and find uh, uh, an alternative. There are plenty of alternatives. Here's an alternative. Right, so let me go on. Um, so I'm interested ultimately in micro-machines, and the idea comes uh, that the material should be the machine. It's like this saying, famous saying, the medium is the message, which is the internet. And that's because we want to have complex motions, but without, on a very small scale, having to emulate nature and have cogs and wheels and gears. Um, they should be controllable uh, either by themselves or remotely steered, and ideally no heat and no electricity. I'll show you that. And it needs to push and pull, and that's really difficult. We've heard about muscles, and the muscles essentially only pull, and if you want to push, you've got to have a second muscle that pulls in a different way. Um, and that's difficult if the body is slender, and we're going to look for slender objects. Now, I had a slender object which was just a, a, a sheet of uh, uh, poly uh, um, methyl methacrylate, but let, let me assume that this is the object and it wants to grow and push. And if it pushes, then it will be like I'm pushing on it and it will have an Euler strut instability. So if something is slender, it's not a good pusher. So it's this. And everybody knows the Euler strut instability. And that will pervade much of the talk that I'm going to give. And there are lots of other things we'd ideally like. We want them to be strong but uh, light. We want long stroke and lots of energy. And we want to be able to activate, actuate, um, uh, manipulate, control, and drive very small processes. And one example is in microfluidics. So let me show you a way that it's um, done currently. And it's quite difficult and complex and expensive. So uh, don't worry about the details too much, but we've got some uh, valves and gates, and they're driven by 
piezoelectric sheets, which are very subtle things, and are driven by electricity. And when you're applying electricity, it's not good in the presence of water, for instance. Um, and there's a very complex set of operations that has to take place. Ideally, what we'd like to do is with some soft materials is actually drive it by light, and I'll show you that soon. And for instance, if we've got a channel, we'd want to take this channel, which is uh, on top of some rubber with a lid on top, and we'd want to be able to shut this on and off so we'd have a material here which, when light is shone on it, will actually transform in this really drastic way from a little flat sheet here to a, either a, a pyramid or a, um, or a cone or something to fill this gap, and now there's no flow. So this would be our aim, and so we challenge is we need to take flat sheets that can turn into cones, hemispheres, and really quite challenging things which are not very natural. Normally a flat sheet doesn't turn into a hemisphere. So um, it's going to rely on geometry to a really large extent. Geometry is a study of uh, lengths and angles between neighboring points in space, and uh, elasticity is very closely related to that. Elasticity is how, instead of having a space which transforms into another space by itself, and there's a metric, we're going to actually pull and deform on it, and there's an elastic, uh, sorry, an, uh, an elastic uh, cost uh, which in solids, which is resisted. Um, it's the energy rises as we stretch something. So um, if we have spontaneous lengths and angle changes, which is what we need if we shine light on something and it deforms into a, uh, a cone, then uh, we have to go beyond simple inflation and deflation. Uh, we have to, presumably if it changes its natural shape, we have to change its metric. We have to do that drastically. And you might say that if we're doing a, achieving an interesting mechanical effect, then you might call this metric mechanics. So that's a sort of uh, shorthand code I might have for that. So uh, by simple inflation or deflation or length change, I just mean something like that. We've got to get beyond that, uh, even if we can provoke it with light. So, um, the, uh, so this is not going to be a very technical talk. A few tenses will appear now, but they'll rapidly disappear. Um, and if you want more details on uh, Thursday, I will talk about that. So um, uh, with um, elasticity, we want a differential uh, a displacement. So I can have two uh, points here. Uh, you can see them on this piece of rubber. Uh, they're separated by a vector r naught. And if I just do this to it, it clearly is not elasticity. What I've got to do is move the top relative to the bottom, and then these guys actually resist. So it, it's not, elasticity is not about translations. It's about differential uh, distortions. And that's what this cartoon is showing. So we have, uh, we have these two points, and they uh, increase their separation relative to each other. Um, they do that because this point here um, moves uh, to another point here, and this is changing from point to point as we go from the reference state to the target state. So I'm talking elasticity now. I have a reference, and it stretches to a target, and there's a cost for doing so. But I could think about it another way. I could think about it just as saying, well, there's a basis uh, uh, s um, space, which is this r these r noughts, and they change by some tensor operation that we've seen on the previous slide to a new space uh, um, without a naught. So we call this a basis, which is the reference, and it describes it describes um, the um, it describes the space that uh, defines um, uh, is a sort of reference uh, or a basis state which defines the space that we're going into. So that we have um, uh, this deformation from this state to this state. And if I want to look at the sum of the squares of the, uh, of the length element, then I uh, can write it in these terms here. I can flip this around, and this is the original length squared before I've operated it on with lambda. So um, I can say that the new length is actually flipping this around, the original squared, the original length, and this tensor in between, which I can group together and call the metric tensor. So it describes to us how we 
go from some sort of uh, basis to the actual shape that we're dealing with. And that looks very much like uh, uh, elasticity theory. Um, elasticity says, well, I don't, uh, s this is just not just a transformation from a basis to the current space. It's actually what we inflict on the material. And um, it's uh, in terms of displacements or gradients of displacements, uh, U. And uh, so we can look at the change in the square of the lengths by subtracting the original length off. And to cut a long story short, it's this change in length, difference in the length squared is in terms of a strain tensor. So um, the two look very much alike, and there is an intimate relationship between the length changes which give elasticity, which is this thing, and what also then looks like a, a metric tensor. And that will be essential when we try and induce these systems to change their shape. And these uh, have to be invariants, for, ins invariant, for instance, under rotations of the reference uh, space, and so that this combination of uh, the two uh, strain tensors, the Cauchy tensor, has to be invariant. And so the free energy must be expressed in terms of the, uh, uh, the invariance. And the simplest possible invariant is just the, uh, the, well the of, of C is just its trace. And that turns out to be the energy of classical rubber. So we're dealing with a very simple but very interesting material. So I want to try and relate this. This is the end of all of these tenses to, yes? Uh, I think that's the right, but I wouldn't like to say while I'm on my feet. Somebody? Okay. It depends which order you put those, those in. Right. So um, let's look at some uh, uh, geometry. Well, I don't have my beam with me. It's a... Uh, it's stuck somewhere, anyhow. Uh, so I can take a beam and I can bend it, and it goes like this, and it doesn't actually cost me very much uh, to bend it. What I uh, brought along, should have brought along, was something very strong, and I can bend it like this, but I certainly couldn't begin to stretch it. I can't really stretch this either. So bend is, um, uh, why is so bend so easy? Well, the reason bend is so easy is nothing very much happens. So, um, you don't have much extension above the neutral plane and you don't have much compression below the neutral plane to get a large deflection. So uh, think of bend as being something easily achieved but pretty useless if you want to actuate or do serious work. I'll come back to that. And bend is weak, basically. So uh, I said this right at the beginning, the Euler strut instability, if I push on the end of a slender object by bringing this assembly down, then it will just buckle. And uh, so uh, I've shown this with rods and strips, um, and I can also uh, show it with the ha handle of a spoon. And I'll come back to the spoon in a moment, but you see I can bend it quite well. I can't begin to stretch it, but I can bend it. So bend is very weak. This is building up to the geometry, if you like. So there are no slender pushes. You cannot push something with something that's slender because it will just bend, and that's no good. Um, so let me uh, talk about um, the lateral response. If I stretch something, then typically it will shrink sideways. So if I stretch something by a factor of lambda, uh, so let me try and do that, then you see that it gets quite a lot thinner. I can't clamp it very well with my fingers, but Take my word for it, it gets thinner as I, narrower and thinner as I stretch it. And rubber does that uh, perfectly in the sense that it's at constant volume, so that when I stretch it by a factor of lambda, it has to contract by a factor of one upon root lambda in order that the two factors of one upon root lambda cancel the factor of lambda that way, and the volume is constant by multiplying the three dimensions together. Okay, so rubber is special, it's incompressible, its Poisson ratio has to be a half. We have to have lambda to the minus half there. So let's look again at the bending of a beam. So I'm going to uh, take a beam, let me take uh, a rather short beam, which is this uh, rubber, pencil rubber, and if I bend it, 
you can see that below the neutral plane, I compress, and above the neutral plane, I elongate. And that's fine, but you must remember that I have um, longitudinal, below the neutral plane, for instance, I have longitudinal compression. That is, along this way, it compresses, and therefore it must extend perpendicularly. And likewise, at the top, it stretches this way, so it has to contract perpendicularly. So it has to form a saddle. So um, you get a saddle, and if you look at this and you pass it around and look at the top, you can see a perfectly good saddle. So you can bend that quite a lot. And I have another one here which has got a crack in it. So you can only bend it that way. Otherwise, it's going to break. Well, you don't need to see that, but maybe you can pass it on. And if it breaks, don't worry, I have plenty more. Right, so a pencil eraser is an example of that. Now, um, that's called anticlastic response. It says that things naturally want to form saddles if you bend them. And um, so um, I've shown you that with a pencil eraser. Um, so you might ask yourself, why don't you see that on a grand scale? If you take it, an object like this, not a very good object since it's sheets of paper, but um, if I bend it like this, why don't I see a gigantic anticlastic response? And the, the, the reason for that is that if I take an object which is curved and I've tried to bend it, then actually it causes stretch. If I bend it like this, I can, I can do that. This is steel, but it's perfectly able to be done with my fingers. But if I bend it like this, then the part of the tape which is far away from the neutral plane is getting seriously stretched. And a tape measure has good ways of getting around that. It just avoids it. And now it's bent this way and not that way. It won't be bent both ways. If it bends both ways, then we've got stretch. And that's going to be what we're looking for. Um, so along the way, um, there's um, a remark one can make that there's a curvature theorem which says that if I take a bit of this tape, which I've cut off, and I put it on top of the bent tape, it will fit perfectly. Oh, I need another hand. Can you just hold it on, on the top? You may have to stand up to do so. Um, so some of the audience can see. And as I pull this in and out, the fit is always perfect. It doesn't matter what the opening angle is. So there's a theorem to that, uh, uh, to that purpose. I can pass these around, and you can see that there's a small piece there. And uh, afterwards, those who are interested, I can, uh, I can prove that. If you want to take it and pass it back. So it, it's, it's a serious point. It's the point we're going to persist with throughout this lecture, that we want to avoid curvature. So here's a bicycle clip. It's, there's steel inside here. It's clipped. Uh, it's curved that way, and if I go like that, it rolls up to its natural curvature this way. I don't know whether you guys have seen this, these before. Do you have these in Brazil? This is from Norway, this one. <laughs> My son works for the company that, makes, that uses that for advertising. Uh, well, that's another story. Okay, so um, it's all around us, this avoidance of stretch. So um, let me now uh, give you a short outsider's version of uh, differential geometry because it's about lengths and angles and curvature, Gaussian curvature, and the intrinsic nature of spaces that we saw this morning uh, vi very vividly. So um, if we have curvature, well, we have um, things that are flat, and sheets of paper uh, uh, are that. And... So this is flat, and um, I can make it into something that's uh, a, a cylinder, for instance, and that's all right. And I can make it into a cone, but I'll say a lot more about cones in a moment. And cones, like cylinders, in some sense are flat. The paper is not crinkled. So they're flat, um, and uh, the Gaussian curvature, which is the product of the bend this way and the bend this way, is zero, because there's nothing this way. So this is flat space. And um, we have to s say we could wrap a cylinder, for instance. It's no problem. Um, but there's this towering figure who stands behind us, Gauss. Um, if you have bend in more than one dimension, 
you have, uh, for instance, spheres, um, you, <laughs> well done, <laughs> uh, you have uh, spatial curvature, um, and that spatial curvature comes because the metric varies. And so I want to uh, discuss uh, that, but the curvature is the usual thing we understand. Uh, it's the simple expression if we're at a point where we've got locally flat if we're in this coordinate system. So um, curvature depends on gr uh, second derivatives and is not local. So uh, can we wrap a sphere with a sheet? No, and that's the map maker's problem. We definitely can't. So I bought a sphere, um, and uh, perhaps I even show it. There we go. Um, uh, there's no wrapping a sphere with a sheet. I mean, this sounds like a trivial point, but I, I hope to show that it's at the core of the actuation. Here's the sphere, and there's the sheet, and it's a terrible job. It's all crinkled up. The dimensions this way are wrong for this particular radius. Uh, so this is a trivial uh, point. Um, so uh, it's the map maker's problem. The other problem is that uh, the angles of triangles, if you draw them on a sphere, they don't, the internal angles don't add up to 180 degrees. So here's one I drew before, down to the equator from the pole, 90 degrees at each point, and so that's 180 degrees, and then I got all of this, which is an extra. So it's a sort of litmus test, if you like, for uh, curvature. Um, so this is uh, Mercator, and he found ways of dealing with that. Um, so uh, what about, um, uh, so spheres are, and saddles for that matter, are non-developable surfaces. We can't wrap them, but they have intrinsic curvature. So if you're an ant sitting on the surface of a sphere, you can tell whether it's curved because you walk in a big triangle and you discover the angles aren't uh, what you thought they were. And uh, we can have spherical spindles as well, where there's also constant uh, Gaussian curvature, but the two individual uh, curvatures are not equal, and that's generic, if you like, rather than a sphere. And we can have saddles, we can have pseudospheres and so on, where the curvature is negative. Right. Uh, so what about going beyond simple elastic stretch? I mean, this is just not good enough. I can't, I can't actually pr uh, uh, push something with something so slender, I can pull it. And so we want to be able to develop Gaussian curvature, but if it's frustrated, then we have a very strong uh, uh, force uh, developed. And that will be the theme. So I show here uh, the cup of a spoon, and so wherever the spoon is that I attempted to bend. If I try to bend the cup of the spoon by pressing down, then I have a serious problem that just can't be done. It will fracture. So let me show you why. So if I attempt to press down on it, then uh, I will cause compression along the radii and stretch on perimeters. So uh, that's great. If I could induce something flat to become curved, then if I put something in the way, there will be a very strong force on me. And that's the, uh, the direction I want to go. So this is a very happy story to start uh, with, uh, with physicists. It's about a physicist who became fabulously rich. And uh, he happens to be a um, fellow of my college. And there's another fellow of my college in the audience. There he is. You know the story? Perhaps not. You, you know it, yeah. Yeah. So um, if you have a bimetallic strip, it will, as you heat it, gradually bend. And if you're using that to switch a very high current, that's extremely bad because you have arcing of a very high current. You will rapidly have a serious fire. And so this man, Taylor, who invented uh, these bimetallic domes as switches for electric kettles, he has three of them in every electric kettle. Here's the control element of an electric kettle. He makes essentially all of the electric kettles in the world. He makes a million a week, has done so for 30 years. So you can imagine, well, you can do the arithmetic, I'm sure. Uh, so this is a very happy physicist, a very happy story. He was a physics undergraduate at Corpus. So um, how do these work? Well, imagine you've got a, not a bimetallic strip, but a bimetallic dome, and the inside wants to heat 
uh, expand a lot more than the outside when you heat it, then it has to invert. And so uh, this is the top and this is the bottom of these discs. And when you heat them, they will uh, invert and then uh, uh, go back when they cool. And of course, they invert at 100 degrees or thereabouts, which is when uh, uh, water boils. So I will do this with the aid of the tweezers and the... You see, I don't practice this very often. Ah, here we go. So I'm heating this, and it's just clicked and inverted. So I will put it down there, and we can watch it, and I'll uh, do another one with the... And I'll put that the other way up, as you can see on the diagram. So here we go. Ah, and you saw that, you heard that, go back, it inverted. And if you wait a little while, that will invert as well. As it cools down, the kettle has been switched off by this action, then uh, it, um, it will uh, go back to its original state. Okay, so um, there it goes. We'll come back to that at the end because it will happen again. So what is the difference between a bimetallic cap and a strip? Why, why doesn't a strip do this? Well, we're back to the old problem that strips, it's purely of geometry, some elongated object like this can solve the problem a different way. But a, um, a dome can't. You might ask, why is this finger cut out? That finger is cut out to increase the amplitude and therefore diminish the machine tolerance that's needed in mass production and reduce the price of these. It's as simple as that. And it provides a, a nice way of the thing to go through from one state to another. Sorry? Oh, millions, millions. It's, it's, it's a spring steel, essentially, of different types. So it's like flipping a, a, uh, uh, one, of, one of these. Th this, this you could do forever as well. It doesn't go to its plastic limit. Right, let, what about cones? Now, cones are going to figure in this story. And cones, well, if you draw a circle on a cone, uh, it's still a circle, and that's fine. Um, if I was to draw a circle penetrated by the tip of a cone, then this uh, is not fine because if I look at this, I look at the, uh, the radius, the radius uh, divided into the per, uh, the, this perimeter here, that ratio is not 2 pi, and therefore it's not in flat space. So the cone, although it's officially flat in some sense, oh, sorry, it's got, um, it's got uh, sh straight um, uh, uh, generators, uh, it's not, it's got uh, some Gaussian curvature there, and I'd like to investigate that. They've got uh, localized Gaussian curvature, and it must be at the tip. So let me, uh, why? Let me demonstrate this with triangles. Now, you have to be careful with this demonstration um, and not believe it, but let me explain later why not. You see, if I take this triangle, it's clearly a, a regular sort of triangle, it's angles add up to 180 degrees. Paper is not going to uh, distort very much. And if I go like this, it's still a re perfectly respectable triangle and its angles add up to 180 degrees. If they didn't, it meant that this, pa this paper had distorted. And the paper doesn't distort, it tears if you try and distort it by this sort of amount. However, here's another triangle. And you can see this is quite a different triangle because it's penetrated by the tip. And as I then do the same trick, it's quite clear that the angles, of the, uh, the angles of this triangle are now quite different. They add up to not 180 degrees because um, the tip has penetrated this. It captures the Gaussian curvature that is localized at the tip. Now, let me put this to the side because I will return to this and it really isn't right for the sorts of problems we're about to do. And it's very revealing why that's uh, not right. It's to do with the evolution of the geodesics in this surface. Right. So let me talk about the materials that we need in order to do better than this. If we want to create something which is going to develop curvature, then these materials are going to have to change their natural shape enormously, and they therefore have to develop a metric that is equivalent to a curved space. And the 
the material to do it with is rubber in some sense. So if, let me look at a model of rubber. It's a block, one by one by one, a cube. It's got some chains in it which are connected to each other by these uh, dots. And when you extend it by a factor of lambda, and it shrinks transversely, then, it's, um, then um, these chains become elongated. So if I looked at a distribution of chains and I apply very large lambda to it, they will be stretched out and they have a very low entropy. Heat will be released and the system will resist this extension because um, uh, it's at a uh, and it, it's got a, a, a high, um, much higher free energy. Now, uh, I have a helper to. Um, what I would like to do is to try and refix your ideas of how extensible solids are. So if you take this end and wrap it round, and if you go up those stairs there, I think, um, and um, so well, wait a minute before you go. Let's uh, let's calibrate this. Ha grab it firmly round round your hand so it doesn't slip out. Uh, what is that about? Well, actually, why don't you take? I'll take the end, and you take the. Uh, you come up to about two meters from me, or is that? That's more than two meters. Can you reel some in and then wrap it round your hand? A bit more. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's quite long. Okay. So that's about three meters. Would you say four meters? Let me let me come in. We do, don't make it too long. Okay. That's three. Right. So let's watch it stretch. Now, many in the audience have seen this before, but many of you have not. And I thought it would still be relevant. Okay, uh, Leo, go up the stairs. But try not to do it directly on top of my laptop. <laughs> keep going, keep going. So this is stretched easily by a factor of five. We could make it stretch a factor of ten quite easily. No, the first thing you notice about this is it's approximately the strength of human muscle. The second thing you notice is that it's, um, it's deformed enormously without plastic failure, so it really is quite um, extensible, and it's done this relatively quickly. Well, you think that's quick, but if you now let it go, Leo, it comes back at a rate which is limited by the speed of sound in rubber, which is 10 meters a second. The fourth, oh, thank you, Leo, that, that's enough. <laughs> No, 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 I wouldn't do that to a friend. <laughs> um, so the, the, the fourth thing to notice is this is very cold. This is a heat pump. And so when it retracted, it had to recover the heat that it had lost when it went to a low entropy state, and it takes it initially from the matrix. And you feel that most acutely in your lips. So rubber is like a perfect gas. It's entirely entropy-driven, but it doesn't have its volume constrained as a perfect gas does. It has its shape constrained. That's another story, and I won't go into that here. That uh, you need when you look at the statistical mechanics. Now, people have complained through this meeting so far that everything seems to hinge on liquid crystals. And um, I have to offer an apology. Liquid crystals are rod-like molecules, and they are densely packed. They form a liquid, and at high temperatures, it is uh, disordered. And at low temperatures, they are orientationally ordered, but not positionally, so they flow like a liquid. And there's a special direction, which is the director. So this is um, one in a bottle being heated. It's now practically melted. The white is the, this phase, and the, it's a first-order phase transition. And this um, uh, clear is the, uh, the heated phase, and it's practically all melted. Both are liquids. And if you now uh, wait a moment, then this will cool. Uh, as soon as it gets the heat out, it goes through a first order phase change, slightly denser in this phase than that, and so it forms at the bottom. Right. So these are liquids, and they're orientationally um, ordered. Uh, so given we're talking about rubber, we want to make these into polymers. And the way to make them into polymers is to have a, uh, sorry, a rigid rod and you have a flexible spacer between the two, and the pneumatic rods induce elongation into the backbone. And no force is required for that. That's completely spontaneous. So we had to do that by pulling on the rubber 
but if you've got these rods, then you get order uh, in their direction. So the message is, if you extend the rubber, you elongate the chains, and it was resisted, as you saw. If you orient the rods in a pneumatic field, then you naturally elongate the chains, and therefore you would expect a rubber made of this would simply get longer and shorter. And that's indeed exactly what happens. So here's my cartoons again. I've got my chains, and they're anisotropic. So here's a distribution of them, which is slightly elongated in this direction. I have suppressed the rods. The rods are in the background doing all the uh, ordering of these chains, but I've put them aside for this cartoon. And uh, so then if I go into a state of different anisotropy, more anisotropic, then this is elongated and, um, and this characterizes that distribution. And if it elongates by lambda, it will contract by one upon root lambda. So here's the cartoon again, except I'm starting with something that's in the isotropic phase, and it becomes elongated in the anisotropic phase, and it changes its length by a factor of lambda when I cool. Or, as it turns out, it goes into the dark. I'll s s say about that later. So the natural extension is by a factor of uh, some lambda m, which is a cube root of the anisotropy of this distribution. And the anisotropy of this distribution can be as much as 60, and the cube root of 60 is 4, so these materials can elongate and contract enormously. And here's a picture of it doing, in this case. It's in a measuring cylinder, and hot and cold air is being blown up and down the cylinder, and it goes from two units in the hot state to six in the cold state. So it's changing by a factor of three its natural length as the temperature has changed. And I can change the order another way. I can have guests here, which are rods. And in the center of the rods are these dye molecules, which when they absorb light, they bend. And if they bend, they upset the order of the hosts in exactly the same way as we would if we were heating. But in this case, we're doing it by light. And light's much better. It can be delivered quickly and easily and uh, without wires and heat and so on. And here's the unit in the center. It's a dye molecule. And when it absorbs a photon, it bends. So if the, rods, the rest of the rods are connected here, now this molecule looks like that. So it is going to bend and upset its host. And here's an example of one doing so, where light is shone on the top side of this uh, cantilever, causing more contraction at the top than at the bottom because it gets, uh, it gets uh, absorbed. And therefore, this is, a, um, this is just like the bend that you saw before. It, um, and it's very quick indeed. Here's another example where light is shone uh, in a beam like this. It strikes this cantilever. And when it strikes it, it eclipses the uh, beam and flips back. And as soon as it flips back, it's again it's receiving light, and it flips back again. So this is going back and forth at about two or 300 hertz. It's very rapid. It's limited by the inertia of the upper part of the cantilever. And it comes from a differential contraction more at the top than at the bottom. Right, so let me try and now summarize the properties of these materials because that's what I want to put into the geometry that now follows. That when I take a, a, a unit cube of this and there's some distortion, some, not distortion, there's some spontaneous uh, shape change, then it will change by a factor of lambda, oops, uh, sorry, along the director and lambda perpendicular, perpendicular to the director, the ordering direction, and this can be as little as, say, 10%, or it can be a factor of 4. And the perpendicular ex uh, reaction is the parallel one to a power nu, which I now call the optothermal Poisson ratio. It's the, ra the ratio by which it contracts this way if it extends that way. And that can be, uh, that is a half for rubber, and it is uh, between a half and two for glass. So I can summarize that. This lambda now is the natural shape change 
that takes me from some original basis state to the current state of the body as a result of cooling or putting it in the dark or whatever uh, I've done. So this is a summary of what we know. And so now what I want to do is to use this not to just lift a weight up and down in a measuring cylinder, but to do something more powerful. I want to create Gaussian curvature without any stretch energy. And I will do that because I've got a new metric. And so let me look at the simplest possible way of doing this. And this was uh, something that Karl Modas and Kaushik Bhattacharya and I did together. And it sort of rested upon, I realize in retrospect, work done by um, our colleagues, um, uh, Sharon and his colleagues, um, who then later actually did their fundamental work on metric change uh, in connection with pneumatic, which is what we're dealing with. So that's uh, another story that I'll return to. So imagine instead of having a long strip with a director along one direction, I actually had concentric circles. Because if I have concentric circles, then um, I, can, um, I can get a contraction along the perimeter by a factor of lambda, and I get an elongation in the perpendicular direction by a factor of lambda to the minus nu. And that means that the ratio of the perimeter C to the radius R is no longer 2 pi. It started as 2 pi, but the perimeter has got shorter and the radius has got longer. And that's the sign of a cone. So I can work out what the semi-angle of the cone is because I know that this in immaterial radius has grown by this factor. And I know that this circumference has diminished by a factor of lambda. So the radius here that generates it is a factor of lambda smaller. And the ratio of those two is the sign of the semi-angle of the cone. So that the semi-angle of the cone, its sign is lambda to the 1 plus nu. So I've now got a cone, and I've generated it um, from scratch. So here's um, a sheet of this material from Tim White. Um, I think this is a circular one, but any um, spiral here where the angle of the director is constant with a radius, which is a logarithmic spiral, will do the same job. And so he heats this up, and it indeed forms a pretty respectable cone. It's quite a, a, a large cone. But he can also uh, do the opposite, either well, in this case he took um, radial lines rather than circular lines, and then you get what we call an anti-cone, which is um, one of these objects. This is our calculation of that, which is um, where we have negative Gaussian curvature at a point and straight generators. So it's not one of your beautiful um, uh, hyperbolic planes. Uh, we'll come on to those. Okay, so these can be made, and they're very, very nice. Um, so uh, let me put those to one side and think of another strategy of doing this, which we call um, non-isometric origami. That's a word invented by Kaushik Bhattacharya. Where you have piecewise, um, uh, uh, piecewise variation of the director. Now, let me give you a very primitive take on conventional origami. So if I take a flat sheet, I can do folds in it. And so here's one I've done before with this fold down. I push it together and I magic the paper away. It's tucked in underneath. Everybody knows this. And what I've got is a, um, a vertex which has been created because I've removed paper and there's an angular deficit. So in some sense, I've got a Gaussian curved object. All the curvature is at this point, but nevertheless, it's a Gaussian curved object. But the problem with it is, if I attempt to do something with it, like press on the top, it just gets the paper back and uh, it's not been very strong. I mean, there are more sophisticated things you can do with um, uh, origami, but this is not going to work. So um, if I look at this origami v vertex, it's isometric because the paper is not actually changing its length as this example I just showed you where there's an intrinsic length change. And so they're not strong um, lifters. But if I can do non-isometric origami, these will be very strong lifters indeed. So let me show you 
For instance, the simplest case I could do is concentric squares. So this is a topological defect, a discrete version of it. It's difficult to tell whether it's plus or minus one. Let, let's call it plus one. Um, and if I have contraction along the, uh, these lines of director, then it will become a square pyramid. And um, so a square pyramid, it relaxes to a cone uh, if I don't have these folds pre-done. And this has got uh, localized Gaussian curvature. So this is an example of how I can do origami, but where the length changes cause intrinsic um, uh, changes to the uh, geometry. Um, and these lines here, um, well, uh, they remain straight in some sense. They are still geodesics. But any other line on here doesn't remain um, a geodesic. So I might have a straight line in the original uh, system going like this, but it's certainly not a straight line afterwards. And on Thursday, I'll talk about the evolution of geodesics on these surfaces as they evolve. Um, so I now have to come back to this demonstration and apologize because it doesn't really uh, demonstrate. I mean, it's a very convenient and nice demonstration, but it's misleading in the sense that these straight lines remain straight lines, and in some sense, this is still a, um, uh, a triangle, but it's not really, and these will have changed when I actually have a proper evolving system. So this, this is isometric in the sense that the paper is not actually changing its length. Um, and there has to be a very strict grammar for uh, this, and this is a question that worried you, Alessandro, that, um, that uh, uh, if these lines, heavy lines, don't meet the discontinuity with equal angles, then if you have some mechanical changes on each side, they'll be inconsistent and the thing will tear itself apart. So there's a very strict grammar for how you construct these origami patterns. And we have very elaborate ones, but they have to all obey those rules. So here's a square pyramid array, which won't relax into cones. And here is uh, what happened if you take this array of squares. Uh, Tim White did this again. And these guys move up to be an array of square pyramids. Um, and these are very strong actuators. And let me show you uh, what he does. So he um, has these resting on, uh, uh, well, this is in the raised position. And they lift loads. Uh, let me show Yes. Yes. Ah, well, that's Tim White. And he's extremely, well, lots of people are extremely good at this. Now, you take a glass sheet and you make a precise square pattern on it using techniques from micro uh, processor fabrication. And then they uh, cause the anchoring of the director to be perfect. You take another one which is perfectly aligned with it, and the pneumatic pattern comes in from both sides. You make it into a solid, and then you peel the sheets off. Yeah. Right. Uh, interfaces. Yes. Well, I mean that would be if it, if it coupled to the pneumatic, be a very nice way of making a uh, making these. He does for for pneumatic. No, but I mean you could always solidify, uh, uh, and it would be a very good way of doing it. Right here it is. Um, so Tim White is, is making these rise up, and they are lifting. Um, th this uh, sheet here, which is m now into cones, um, it's only a few microns thick, and it's lifting this uh, piece of uh, glass. And now he's um, and it's lifting it through many millimeters. This is a, a standard rule here. So it's lifting its uh, a weight much, much greater than its own through an enormous distance compared with its own thickness. So these really are slender pushers, and to that end, uh, it's, it's a very nice point to get to. Let me show you some more of these. Oh, it's showing the film again. Where is that? Ah, here we go. So um, the specific work, uh, well, if you don't have a load, you don't do much work. And if you have too much load, you have no stroke. And in between, there's a best place to get your specific work out of this. And the, um, the stroke 
well, the stroke is large if you don't have a load, and it gets pretty small if the load is too heavy. So you can explore this space, um, and you can do it lots and lots of times, and he shows that uh, there. Um, and uh, it's if you have a three-by-three three array of defects where you can lift more, well, that's not a surprise. Um, but what's rather more surprising is he puts these tungsten uh, uh, cylinders on top, and this guy you probably didn't notice at the beginning is only about this thick, and it's raised these enormous uh, cylinders through um, a height several times its own thickness. So it is very impressive. But he goes on. This is 400 times its own weight. Uh, this is uh, 2,170 times its own weight, and it's in the raised state here. So it's lifted through this distance approximately, this enormous weight. Um, but he's not finished yet. This is 2,500 times, and again, you're hard-pressed to see the natural thickness of this device. So they really are extremely potent, slender pushers. Uh, and here you see the original uh, before it's warmed up, and then it's lifted through this distance here. So um, in the remaining um, few minutes, um, yes. Well, I think there are two answers to your question. The first is that imagine you are trying to push upwards, but currently you're like this. The most of your push goes against yourself, and the component of the natural um, uh, uh, um, extensile tendency upwards is very small, it's just pure geometry. The second is that um, if you've got something that wants to extend, eventually the, the weight that you're asking it to carry, if you even if you can eliminate buckling, is simply too great. I mean, it would be like taking an elastic body and pushing it back down by applying a huge load to it. But it's not to do with the transition. Well, as, as far as I know, what you saw was in real time. But that was heat. Light would be much quicker because you can deliver it more quickly. It doesn't have to diffuse into the body. Um, sorry? Oh, there is a, a small, it's like in an external field. It's a phase transition in an external field. You will shift it, but it, it's, it, I don't think it's the origin of this problem. The, the shifts are very small. Um, so you might ask yourself, can you do other things? And that's really what I'll talk about later. So I won't say too much about this now. But um, you, for instance, you might want to something that's not a cone, but for instance, a spherical cap, or a spindle, or a pseudosphere. And these can be easily done. Um, and at this point, um, uh, Aharoni um, and others uh, in 2014, they actually attacked this problem properly, and um, they also looked at the inverse problem, which I'll allude to as well. Um, their patterns were not uh, of circular symmetry, but they were Cartesian. So they looked different from this, but they solved the same problem in some sense. So that if you take this spiral, and I won't say too much about what it is, then it will create a spherical cap or a spherical spindle. And if I take a slightly different spiral, it will create a pseudosphere. Um, and there's a spindle. Uh, but can one do more than that? Well, there are two problems. The first is, if I give a, a director distribution, something like this, which I've calculated, what shape will I get? And that's actually, I can calculate the Gaussian curvature, but the shape is actually quite tricky to calculate, but we can do that. And the second is, if I had a particular shape, what pattern should I adopt to find that shape? So there's the forward problem and the inverse problem as indeed Aharoni and others uh, addressed as well. So here's an example of a linear variation of the angle of the director with respect to the radius vector. It's the same everywhere. This is symmetri symmetric. Um, and from that, you can calculate the Gaussian curvature. And with a great deal more difficulty, you can calculate the shape of the shell. 
and then I can look at a quadratic variation and you notice that I have positive and negative Gaussian curvature and the shell uh, has got positive Gaussian curvature here and negative in the tail. And here's an exponential variation and I get a rather more bizarre looking uh, distribution of Gaussian curvature and a rather innocent looking uh, shell out of that. And the inverse problem can be solved too. What sort of spiral is needed in order to get a desired shell, for instance, to get a paraboloid or a catenoid? I can do those very, very simply. They're simple problems. You can do it at Blackboard. Uh, others involve um, integral equations. Um, and you can also write these patterns on a 3D structure. So just like here, I started with a bimetallic dome which had one curvature and I inverted it. Well, Tim White and others, or um, Ware in fact, um, were able to do this and they found that this, uh, uh, this structure inverted and went to this one and on its way it leapt into the air just like these guys did when they cooled. So it's the same problem. So um, let me conclude. Um, I think you can get new sorts of mechanical possibilities if you pay more attention to geometry. And in particular, you're not satisfied with a simple strip, but you do something more imaginative with the geometry. And with that, you can get Gaussian curvature from flat sheets because you have variation of the metric tensor. You can induce that either with light or with heat. Um, you can wrap a sphere with a flat sheet, which is the map maker's problem. Um, you can make shells to order. Um, but the real point is you can have strong but slender pushes and lifters and actuators. Um, and then there's some other things I haven't spoken about, but it is interesting that the US Air Force, which is where Tim White is, is extremely interested in these, and I think they're thinking of looking at that for adaptive uh, aeronautics. And so with that, I would uh, conclude and thank you for your attention.